Um, how many CFIs in the room? Okay. How many DPEs in the room? One DP. Okay. I'm going to check in with you later, Andrew, um, and kind of bring this full spectrum. So I'm from Akron, Ohio. Um, been flying helicopters a long time, been flying airplanes a long time. And uh, this has become an incredibly important topic that we're trying to get out. So I'll make, uh, give you my email at the end of the presentation. Feel free to take a picture of it, reach out to me. I'll do this presentation for your pilots group wherever <clears throat> um, uh, on Zoom. Uh, if I can get to you, I will. Uh, but if I can't, I'll be glad to do it um, on Zoom. So we're just trying to get the word out. So. Um, we're going to, I'm going to take some liberties, um, and I just want you to roll with me for just a little bit. We're going to combine some terms, and I'll tell you why we're doing it this way. So here's a term that many of you are probably familiar with, rotor downwash. And <clears throat> we, we say, you know, okay, the, the, the helicopter's at a hover. Obviously, the air's moving down, creates downwash. Then what happens to it? Does it just disappear? Does it go somewhere? So what happens to it? Somebody take a guess. What happens to this air? The helicopter's out of hover. You don't have to know all about helicopter aerodynamics. I'm not going to get out the... It, it, say it, Jeffrey. Yeah. Yeah, it bounces off the ground and it moves. And it moves outward. And you're going to see it moves outward a lot farther than you think it does. And so <clears throat> when we talk about downwash, it is connected to the aircraft either at a hover or extremely slow hover taxi. And, and just a couple of other terms here. Um, uh, hover is stationary, hover taxi is moving forward. Um, air taxi is when the aircraft is a lot higher. You'll hear, sometimes hear a controller say air taxi and they'll go up above 10 to 15 feet and they'll move kind of rapidly from one side of the airfield to the other. Um, we're gonna keep this right now at, at uh, hover or, or hover taxi. The other thing I want uh, you to be aware of, when we bring a helicopter to a hover and we are in hover taxi, we are in full flight. And, and I say that because, and, and some of you went go, well, yeah, but if your brain is only in the fixed wing world and you think of the word taxi, you're not in any flight at all. So you're not thinking about vortices, you're not thinking about aerodynamics. All you're thinking about is staying on the center line, because if you don't, the instructor's gonna whack you in the head, and you're thinking about where do I have the yoke, because the winds are coming out of here, they're coming out of there, and I gotta turn this way, I gotta push it forward. And you're not thinking about flight, because it's not. When we bring a helicopter to a hover, we are in full flight. We're in full flight. Now, <clears throat> here is the technical term Rotorcraft wake vortices. And rotorcraft wake vortices are generally associated, according to the FAA and technical manuals, when the aircraft is above ETL, effective translational lift. Basically, here's the real simple part of this, when the aircraft gets somewhere between 16 and 20 knots, depending upon the airframe, somewhere in that vicinity, it becomes much more efficient in its aerodynamic ability to fly, it requires less power. And what happens is, is your downwash stops, but your wake vortices that trail behind the helicopter begin to happen. And, and th this is where, for an enormous amount of the community, this is lost in our heads. Paul just said it, hadn't thought about it. Um, I can't begin to tell you the number of people that I've talked to who've gone, yeah, I guess so. I just never really thought about it because we've never really taught it. We've never really done much with it. And I'll show you a report that we dug to find um, that's kind of buried and it really tells the whole story. Now the problem with the term wake vortices is if I were to be a controller and get up there and say caution wake vortices, I'd have every pilot looking at each other going, what the world's he talking about? Because that's not a term that you've been taught. Unless you're a helicopter pilot and you had to get ready for a check ride and it's a part of some advanced rotorcraft aerodynamics, no one ever talked about wake vortices and you wouldn't know what it meant. So I'm taking some liberties here. This is not an official term, but I think we need to turn it into one. 
caution helicopter wake turbulence. Let's call out the airframe and let's use the term that we're all been taught and furthermore, let's not confuse the mind. The last thing we need to do is give you one more term to memorize to be a, a, a pilot. So let's not say, well, it's wake turbulence when it's a 737, but it's wake vortices when it's a helicopter, and it's this kind when it's that kind, and we just don't need to do that. The mind just needs to go, oh, wake turbulence, danger. That's all I need to know. Landing, taking off, wake turbulence, danger. Do you really care what airframe produced it? You probably shouldn't, to be honest with you. There are some differences between the two, which I'm gonna get to in just a moment, but beyond that, um, it, it's wake turbulence. So we're just driving this, um, driving this uh, terminology out into the industry. It's helicopter wake turbulence. If you look it up, uh, you won't find it. You'll find uh, wake vortices, you'll find rotorcraft vortices, but you really won't find helicopter wake turbulence in an official publication. So if, you, if you're one of those that is gonna go out and look at it and then sharpshoot me on it, you can. I'm telling you, we're pushing it out there. We're gonna try to get it there. <clears throat> So why are we here? What is going on? What, 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 why am I standing here? Well, on September 18th uh, last year, I was at the Wadsworth Airport, which is about 12, 15 miles uh, due west of Akron, Ohio, where I'm from. My buddy Gordon uh, was with me. We were at a pilot's club. We were doing a clam bake. Everybody was having a wonderful Sunday after, Saturday afternoon. We were just having a great time. And a Rans 20 home-built aircraft was getting ready to depart the airfield. <clears throat> uh, the gentleman had built it, and it was still within. I'm not a home-built guy, so I'll probably get this wrong. It was in its 40 hours of fly-off, or whatever they call it. And he was trying to work the bugs out to get his airworthiness within a certificate. So <clears throat> he had taxied down to the departure end of the runway um, to take off. A uh, S-76 helicopter was returning to its base at the airfield um, and uh, was coming in uh, across the approach end. Um, a normal approach to landing, nothing remarkable. Um, the pilot in the Rams 20 called out to the S-76 and said, hey, can you sidestep the runway? I'm in a hurry to take off. We don't know to this day why he was in a hurry. It was a beautiful day. There was no weather moving in. He really couldn't go more than 25 miles during daylight anyway, so we're really not sure why he was in a hurry. We will, and we'll never know. We can speculate, but we don't know for sure. Uh, the 76 came, they sidestepped the runway, being good neighbors, sure, we'll be glad to. Um, with a very short delay, the Rans 20 took off, got into the wake turbulence of the helicopter, uh, rolled left, then rolled right, went upside down, impacted the ground, um, killed the pilot, aircraft burst into flames, is total, total destruction. Um, so that tends to wake you up. And when you've been in this industry as long as I have, we all kind of stood around and talked to everybody. And uh, the next day, Gordon talked to the NTSB and the FAA, and it's like everybody was going, never even thought about it. Right? Never even thought about it. And you'll know why in just a minute. So you can see here, um, the red arrow is the departure of the Rams 20. The, my green squiggly line is pretty close to what the helicopter did. Um, there was really no delay from the time the helicopter uh, passed by the Rams 20 on the ground. Uh, sidestepped the runway, was going into their base, and approximately 25 seconds later, um, he took off, uh, hit the wake, um, the wake turbulence, rolled left, rolled right, went inverted and crashed. Um, so not very, not very long. Um, how do we, how do we know this other than eyewitness reports? Because we have it on video. Um, I will not be showing the video to you. It's pretty tough to watch and we've, uh, we're keeping that private out of, uh, for the family and everybody else, we just don't want it out there and hitting YouTube, which we're sure that it would do if we started sharing it. But um, we, and, and it's not, a, uh, it's not a, uh, a video from a bank where you can't see anything. Uh, it's a video from like a liquor store. They have the best security videos in the world and this one happens to be crystal clear. 
And so there's really no question at all what happened here at all. Um, so uh, that's how we know we're very certain what happened. Um, so let's give some other perspective here and just get our heads in the game and wrapped around a little bit. So here's uh, a graphic of kind of what's happening when uh, we're in downwash. We're going to start with downwash and then we're going to go to um, wake turbulence uh, that's left behind a helicopter in forward flight. Um, so <clears throat> I'll start at the bottom in R22, Robinson. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, and I'm willing to do it on Zoom for any group you'd like me to. And I'll give you my information. Thank you for asking. Um, an R-22, Robinson, uh, somewhere around a 1,300-pound helicopter. Um, it's got a 25-foot rotor diameter. So we've got three times that, which is what the FAA does call for. Um, and you'll see that remain three rotor disks away um, uh, from a hovering helicopter. And so this is what three rotor disks looks like. Okay, um, it, and from a Robinson, it's 75 feet. A Bell 206, which is a Jet Ranger, um, and, and you can just put B, if you don't know what that looks like, just go Bell Jet Ranger or B-206 helicopter in Google and you'll get a picture of it. You go, oh yeah, I've seen a thousand of those. Uh, it's 33 feet, uh, so you got about 99 to 100 feet. And then an S-76 um, is 48 feet. And it's about 144 feet to be exact. Call it 150. I went to public school. My math is not that great, so I tend to round things off. So do you need to memorize all these aircraft and their rotor disc diameters? No, you don't. What I would recommend you do is have a sense of, oh, you know, that's about that and that's about that. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is um, what you want to do is be able to just look at the helicopter and in your mind go, one, one, two, three. Oh, about there. If you can do that, then you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So this is what they're talking about. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is you'll notice the two uh, blue arrows at the bottom going directly out. Here's what we know through some testing. We've pulled some old reports from the FAA. The rotor wash comes down, it hits the ground, and it not only loops back up, but it also goes straight out. And it goes straight out, and, and they believe that it actually picks up speed. The sensors that they put out there, that it actually picks up speed. I'm not exactly sure why it would pick up speed. You'd think it'd slow down, but it actually picks up some speed. Um, why do we come up with this three rotor disc diameter? Because it still produces hazardous winds that far out. So to give you an idea, at our subject airport, um, a very common 1960s built, uncontrolled airport in the United States of America is going to look very much like this dimensionally. 3,000, 3,500 feet, uh, somewhere between a 50 and 75 foot wide runway, and the distances from the taxiway to the runway are approximately 140 feet. I've done this with a bunch of them. I'm using this. Uh, you'll find some that are a little different here and there. But they're generally pretty close to this. So this is just kind of a good way to, to keep your head in the game. So you've got about 135, 140 feet between the center line of the runway and the center line of the taxiway. And I just got done saying that an S-76 is producing hazardous winds up to 150. So you got a 15-foot delta here. You're still within the danger zone. So what does that then look like to the average fixed-wing pilot? I'm getting ready to take off. There's an aircraft on the taxiway. I really don't care about the aircraft on the taxiway because they're on the taxiway. They're at a taxi. Remember what I said about it, what our brain tricks us to thinking. They're at a taxi. No big deal. It's a helicopter hovering, and we slam the throttle forward and take off, and then we wonder why we're having some problems. So this is why this is important. I'm, we're trying to raise that awareness and get people to go, gee, I'd really like that helicopter to move or I'm going to wait, one or the other. So to kind of help you uh, attach this to some other airports so you can, on the, in the moment, get your eyes kind of gauged to say, oh, that's about that distance and that's about that distance. My home airport, Akron Fulton Airport, which is not Akron Canton, it's the downtown airport with the air dock, if you've ever been there. Uh, we got 6,300 feet, 150 foot wide runway, 
and the distance uh, between the two is about 400 feet. So the larger, uh, the larger runway we have, um, we're getting more distance from the runway, and that's through airport design, runway safety areas, type of aircraft. It gets pretty complex why that happens. But just so you understand, the shorter the runway, probably the closer the taxiway. The longer the runway, probably the farther apart the taxiway, just so you know, um, especially on older built, uh, older built uh, airports. Now, a couple of other dimensions that I've taken here um, just to give you an idea, and it kind of doesn't matter where these airports are, but you'll notice that on the one on the right, uh, there, the, the runway is not really the issue here that I'm trying to point out. The issue is between the taxiway and the parking. So now, what do we have? Well, we've got, uh, let's just assume for a moment, on the left of that little uh, grassy area, the helicopter's parked and they're tuning up and the airplane is taxiing down. They're 117 feet away and the helicopter starts to pull pitch and it, depending upon the airplane, it can turn you right upside down. And again, it's not something we think about. We think, oh, the helicopter's over there and parking. And honestly, we in the helicopter world are worried about us flying and while we do our best to not do damage to the area around us, we still have to fly our aircraft and we still have to have you be on the lookout for us as we need to be on the lookout for you. Uh, the aircraft, or I'm sorry, not the aircraft, the, um, the uh, 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 airport on the left is about 275 feet um, and I believe that's Chandler, Arizona if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and that's between the runway and the taxiway and then you can see the amount of ramp space out there. So this is just to give you some, some numbers in your head. When it started to do this, it was like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yes, sir. There is. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, two other airports. Um, I'm showing you these two because it really, I'm, I'm trying to highlight the parking area where we can also have problems. So the one on the left, you've got a parking area 275 feet wide. There's probably nowhere I can park the helicopter and park the fixed wing in that general area and not have them uh, be interacted with each other in a negative way. So we just really need to be aware of that. You're parking your fixed wing, you see a helicopter. You know what, I think I'd like to park over here. I can tell you ferrying helicopters all over the country, I try very hard to pick an airport that has a fuel truck because I'm aware of this and I want to stay away from everything and everybody. So I'm looking for a place that has a fuel truck so I can park as far away as I can, they can bring the fuel to me, I don't have to go to them because there's a whole nother issue with that, which I'll share in just a second. Okay, um, the three rotor disc diameter, uh, when the aircraft is at a stationary hover or at a slow taxi, stay away from it. That's, your, that's what you're looking for. There we go. All right, we were able to dig up this um, calculation, and uh, it is uh, more complex than what it even looks like here. To just give you some idea, you need the disc area of the rotor disc. It comes out in meters. You have to then get the radius. You have to then bring it around. You have to then calculate air density in feet per slugs. I didn't even know what that was. Um, I had to then go do about two, or f two to four hours of research on that. Um, depending upon whether it's wet air or dry air, that was a whole other two hours of reading of what are they talking about. So here's what I did to make life easy on myself. By the way, you can find it at airdensityonline.com. Who knew, right? There's a website for everything, right, Brian? Everything, yeah. everything. Um, at any rate, the number I have here is standard day sea level, because I got tired of trying to figure this out and, and do all the other calculations. Um, you take the weight of the helicopter, why did I use 10,000 pounds? Um, our subject S76 is 11,008 gross weight, uh, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, when it was landing, fuel burned off, nobody on board or, or only a small crew on board, calculated it to be around 10,000. So we took that. You could obviously take my Excel spreadsheet, put a different weight in there if you wanted. Um, you divide that in two, you then go through the calculation, you come down to the velocity at uh, miles per hour, I converted it to knots. 
So we've got a 52 knot wind being produced at a hover 140 feet out. If your cub was on the ramp today, or you're 172, and you were drinking coffee, and someone said, there's a storm coming in, they got 50 knot winds, you'd be rear ends at elbows trying to get that thing tied down or in a hangar. Because you'd go, it's going to destroy my airplane. But we hear a helicopter come in, we don't think anything of it. You're not expected to, I get it. That's why we're doing this. It's all right. Don't feel bad. Um, my buddy Gordon over here describes helicopters as moving microbursts, and I think that is probably one of the best descriptions you can have. And if you remember nothing else from today, if you remember that is a moving microburst, and I'm going to stay away from it, you will be way better off. It is absolutely the best description I've heard. Brian, help me. Oh, it's up there. So I thought. Oh, there we go. Okay, thanks. Um, so anyway, dug up this chart, which is basically my Excel spreadsheet in chart format. Um, supports it. Uh, obviously, you can see what's going on at the 35-foot, 40-foot uh, area, you know, depending upon the aircraft you're talking about here. Um, you've got some pretty high uh, velocities and distance out, but all the way out, we're still doing, we're still doing it at 100 feet, we're still doing over 50. That's your red dotted line there. Um, it, it is bad news. It is bad news. So here's what we've talked about, and we've done a pretty good job talking about this. Um, this sign over here, you've seen all over the place. In fact, We've seen it so much, we're all numb to it. We don't even, we ignore it. We just go, yeah, whatever. Uh, those noisy, noisy uh, traffic pattern hogging jerks that make all this noise and dust and, you know, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. A net, oh, I'm just going to ignore it. Because we get numb to it. We see it all the time. It's kind of like the stop sign close to your house and you blow right through it. Oh, geez, I knew it was there. And I just was thinking about something else, right? And we've seen this sort of thing, and those of us in the helicopter world understand this um, from a lot of different perspectives. From flying it, we don't want to get into brownout, but more importantly to you and to the, the rest of us from a ground-based standpoint, what I don't want to do is sandblast all the cars in the parking lot next to the helipad, which can happen. I don't want to do damage to somebody or something. Um, I don't want the lid off my trash can that you've left there to fly off and go through a, a, the front window of the FBO or hit somebody in the head or whatever. I don't want to be the Chinook landing and uh, hit the porta potties and treat them like dominoes and knock them all over. That's a true story. No, I was not flying it. Here's where I'd like to stop and call on my one DP in the room. Andrew. Obviously, when you give an examination, private, commercial, probably every examination, you talk about wake turbulence, yeah? Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it's generally in conjunction with where's the aircraft land, where do you land, where's the aircraft take off, where do you take off? Yeah. Right. Nothing about, Nothing about helicopters. Um, I don't know. Andrew's probably the 50th DP I've asked this, and I've got exactly the same answer which is fine, I get it. Um, here's what my ask is of you. Go back and tell the instructors that send you students, make them read this and then ask them about it. Raise the awareness. I don't expect examiners to jackpot uh, uh, somebody who's never been taught this because there's too many people out there it's never been taught. But I, I, we need to start having this conversation. We need to start having it. Um, I know the DP that we use in our area I brought this to his attention. He said, no, I don't think I've even had this conversation ever with anybody. And he's done, he's been a DP for 20 years. I don't know how many thousands of check rides he's done. It's just not something that we talk about. Okay, here's the part that's not talked about. This is what it looks like in forward flight. These are coming back off the two, um, the left and right side of the rotor disc as the aircraft is in forward flight. 
And I'm going to show you some things in here to show you just how violent these are. And they are violent. We dug up this uh, FAA report. Uh, it was produced in 1996. Um, the number's up there. I'm certainly glad to share it with you. You can go pull it up on your own. It's the final report. Flight test investigation of rotorcraft wake vortices again. That's why I'm trying to change it to wake turbulence um, in forward flight. Now, I, we did find, and there are other reports out there that talk about uh, downwash and out of hover and what's going on at a slow hover. Tons and tons of, they've done all kinds of testing there. Lots and lots of information. This is the only one we could find for forward flight. If you know of another one, please send it to me. So basically, uh, here's what they discovered. They took four helicopters, uh, a CH-53, uh, an S-76, uh, Chinook, and, and a Huey, right? Yeah. And uh, they fixed them with smoke. They took them up to 5,000 feet. They took a T-34 with a highly experienced aerobatic pilot. And they took a decathlon with a highly experienced aerobatic pilot. The T-34, they flew in trail behind the helicopters closer and closer and closer. They did several runs, but they were doing it uh, looking for two different things. What uh, would the aircraft do with uncommanded input from the pilot. In other words, what roll rates and how fast? And then the other thing that they would do is, what would the aircraft do with the pilot trying to keep the aircraft level? And I'll shorten a lot of technical reading for you. This is basically what they discovered. Anything inside of three nautical miles was considered hazardous wake turbulence from the helicopter. And they considered hazardous wake turbulence as putting the aircraft in an uncommanded roll up to 60 degrees in less than two seconds. Try that on short final. You're probably not going to make it. Um, so three nautical miles is your, that's your touchstone number. That's the other number I want you to remember. Now, that's trailing it. You're on final. Number two behind the helicopter, clear to land. So you need to be thinking about three nautical miles as a, at a minimum, at a minimum. Now, what did they do with the decathlon? They actually flew it 90 degrees crossways behind the helicopter to see what would happen. At a half mile, the decathlon experienced something that the pilot could only describe as wing flutter or flap. He said the wing actually started to act like a bird. He said it was so violent that he bailed out of the maneuver and said, yeah, I'm not doing that again. These are test pilots. These guys do this stuff for breakfast. He said, yeah, no, I don't think so. So flying it crossways was even worse. Um, findings, and then I got some things to get your attention. Half mile result, resulted in loss of control. A half mile was loss of control at almost every, with almost every, uh, with every helicopter and every probe. A half mile was loss of control, period. So that's just, that's just a half mile. About uh, February, I was giving some uh, instrument instruction to a student at night. It was one of those nights that was just dead air. It was perfect, it was absolutely perfect. We were working the ILS at Youngstown Airport uh, to runway 32. There was a uh, EC-145, which is a single rotor EMS helicopter, and they were doing the exact same thing. And I actually asked the controller, can you put me behind them? And I was watching them on ADSB, and we were five miles, and then I got us up to four. That's as close as I was willing to get. And flying the exact same glide slope down, and I could feel it at four miles. It was not upsetting the aircraft. We didn't have to do anything. It just felt like minor, minor. At four miles, I was still able to just feel it, and that's as close as I was going to get. Uh, the decathlon experienced shutter or flapping of the wings. The advancing blade leaves more turbulence than the retreating blade. For fixed wing folks, you've got blades coming in a circle. You're moving forward. The one coming forward with you is the advancing blade. The one retreating is the retreating blade. Uh, try not to turn this into a huge aerodynamic lesson here, uh, but they know that it leaves more turbulence uh, than the retreating blade. Does that mean anything to you operationally? Not really. 
Uh, vortex separation increase in, descend, uh, in descending flight and decreases in climbing flight. This is very interesting to me. As the helicopter is descending, the uh, vortexes actually separate and get wider, and when it's climbing, they actually come together. <coughs> when they come together, they're going to get much more violent, which I think is interesting. Um, Fort flight separation, minimum three nautical miles and a minimum of 105 seconds, and at a hover, a minimum of three rotor discs at a hover. All right, I've got some videos to show you. This, sure. You bet. This uh, is a gentleman that was taking off from an airport in the UK, an R44. So you got a 172 at what, 23, 24, 2500 pounds, somewhere in that vicinity. R44 is probably 2,000, 2300 pounds. I have no idea, but uh, pretty close to that. Um, the Robinson took off uh, crossways or across the runway. They were cleared, and this gentleman took off behind them. A couple things I want you to pay attention to. This is a GoPro camera inside the cockpit. Uh, you'll hear him talking uh, with his co pilot. Um, and you'll see him put in full left aileron to keep the aircraft upright. And then you'll see the video play again, and I want you to pay attention not only to that, but uh, try to pay attention to the VSI. You can see it. It's not super clear, but it's clear enough. He's on a normal 172 climb with two people on board. Call it 400 feet a minute. And uh, the VSI goes to zero, and then it pops up to about 600. Even though the wake turbulence here was a non-event, it reminded me that I always have to be vigilant as the amount of control input to correct for the turbulence from an R44 crossing the runway was quite significant. Ready to go? Yep. Good. Rockcliffe, traffic on box we on the roll 27. Rockcliffe. Oh, time is 11. I've got that in my head. Yeah, I got it. I wrote it down. Uh, TNP's good. Yep, TNP's good. Airspeed is alive, 55 rotate. See, I see the chopper. Yo. Feel that? Yep. That was. There's a, v, there's a VSI coming up to about 600. You see the speed at which that went up. And that's a trailing instrument, by the way. That was full lock with the bloody ailerons. Okay, 20 degree right. All right, let's talk about this briefly. Keep something in mind. These aircraft are of similar weight. The Robinson is a two-bladed helicopter, very small uh, signature on the size of the blade, um, number one. Number two, uh, this aircraft was clean configuration, flaps up, full power. And the others I'm going to show you, the aircrafters in landing configuration, uh, flaps down gear. Okay? All right. Do you want to change it now, Brian, or are you good? You want to change the camera now, or are you good? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, this is, I believe, in upstate New York. Uh, an SR-20 student on a, uh, I think, a second solo, landing behind a Blackhawk. Blackhawks, by the way, are around 20, 20 22,000 pounds. So there's a Blackhawk taking off. Watch the signature. 57 seconds is where that started, maybe 56. You'll see the Cirrus come in from the left side of the window there. Here he comes. He's on short final, and there he goes, and he cartwheels down the runway. Aircraft destroyed. I think he broke an ankle and a wrist or something like that, but he did survive. I call these um, I call these innocent accidents. People just don't know. Can you advance my slide, Brian? It's not working. PC-12, gross rate, 9,500 pounds. I have no idea what the aircraft weighs at the moment, but that's a gross weight of the airplane. Again, uh, a Blackhawk and uh, PC-12 landing behind it. Blackhawk's taken off. There's a the PC-12. Oh, 
whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. He caught the... Uh... Okay. Interesting. And this one has made the rounds on YouTube. Maybe some of you have seen it. It was just north of L.A. back in January. Uh, the timestamp is up there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so it's showing uh, 09 on the seconds. Uh, this is a Huey, I think, from Cal Fire is what it looks like to me. He's coming in landing. Escaped with um, injuries, destroyed aircraft. Yes, sir. Right. I fly Black Hawk, so I mean, try to be stuff, but like, you know, we try to stay completely away from everything. But in some planes, we don't know that. Right. He wasn't even close to run away. Nope. He wasn't. Yeah. And, and uh, that Huey is about 10,000 pounds gross weight, 10.5 gross weight, finest helicopter ever designed, ever, full stop. I might have flown them in the Army, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know what he's weighing right out now, maybe 7,500, uh, 8,000 pounds, whatever, have no idea. But um, it's two-bladed, so it's making less of a rotor, uh, uh, a wake turbulent signature than a Blackhawk would, and he still did quite a lot of damage, and he was in forward flight. And I think it's a 30-second delay, 25-second delay of crossing over behind him. Again, and in, I call it an innocent accident because we just haven't taught this stuff. People just don't know. And the controllers are not, I don't have any idea if this was a controller in controller, it doesn't matter. The controllers are not required to uh, report uh, caution wake turbulence until the helicopter is over 41,000 pounds. So the Blackhawk takes off, they're not reporting it. It's a Chinook, it's a CH-53, it's a, you know one of the really big guys. We've got a special guest that I would not just met this morning. Jeffrey, if, if you'd come up, please. So Jeffrey introduced himself to me this morning. Um, Jeffrey was in a 182, correct, sir? Yeah, it was a 182B. 182 in... Uh, you, see the, you see the video with the, the Pilatus? Put this right close to your... Okay, yeah. so the video with the Pilatus that he showed, that... I want that video because in talking to everybody, that happened the day before my accident. So that's right after Hurricane Maria, basically one week after. And we were in a 182A landing at that same airport. And we ended up crashing in a Cessna 182 from two Blackhawks. We were number two behind two Blackhawks flying in tandem doing the same thing that they did. But because at that airport, the Blackhawk base is at the end of the runway so when we came in our plane was it pushed down and we were like two miles in trail and the controller was like you know you're clear to land and it pushes down at the, at, the, at the threshold and we recovered and then about 300 feet down it violently pushed us to the left and the left wing was about a foot off the ground and he recovered again my pilot friend he died in an accident um, and when we turn, when you did that, we said the full go around. We're gonna make, turn to the right. Everybody who knows Esther Grande Airport, the pattern is a left-hand pattern. And we turned to the right because the the blast came from the right. And as we turned to the right, the plane literally went up directly, a hundred um, straight up. And we were only about 60 knots, so you know what's gonna happen. She's gonna stall, roll left, and inverted, bram, crashed. I ended up, he ended up dying 10 hours later from head trauma because we hit. My whole left side here, I broke my wrist, my arm, my, my, I have an artificial hip right now, I have a rod in my leg, nine surgeries later, this is what I'm, I am now. But he lost his whole right side of his face because we hit and he hit the panel. I will, only think, the only reason I'm here today because I survived is because when we took off, he was like, okay, you want to fly? I'm like, no, this is a new plane. He always lets me fly. It was a good friend of mine who always trained me to fly, helped me to learn. But I was kind of upset. And when I'm upset, I don't fly because I was working earlier. And I pushed my passenger seat all the way back 
to enjoy the ride. And because I was an extra foot from the panel is why I'm here talking to you today. The airbags? No, we had hooker harnesses on the plane. And that's another reason why my hip got exploded. Because the, the impact, the, the belt is what exploded my hip, basically. But that is real. And the instructor told us nothing about it. I mean, an instructor, the controller said nothing about it. He said basically, like, look, when we turned final, we felt the bumps, like what you were saying, in trail. And we were going to do um, okay. turning the spacing turns. And he said, do spacing turns, because he realized that we were close in short final. And then basically, Everything else happened after that like that. It was, it was there. And I'm glad you have that video because I talked to people from the ground who pulled me out of the plane who said the day before it almost turned a Pilato, almost made a Pilatus crash, and that's the video. Thank you. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Just a couple of takeaways and things you can share with your friends, okay? Helicopter hovering is a mi uh, moving microburst. And I would tell you, it's the same thing in forward flight. Three rotor diameters away. Forward flight create violent wake turbulence behind. Treat them as a heavy aircraft. And the decay of the turbulence is two to three minutes and three nautical miles. And um, I'm willing to do this for your any group you want me to. Sure, sure. Yep. I'm willing to do this for any group you want me to. I'm a FAA fast team rep. I can do the spans for your group. I'll do it uh, on Zoom, wherever you are, doesn't matter. Um, feel free to reach out to me.